Hello and welcome back to the discourse. It's time for all of us to make our fall plans and these should definitely include the excellent new remake of the 90s horror classic, Candyman. Well, we're still alive. <laughs> Let's go. Trina, you've broken the door. Director Neil Long, working with co-writer and co-producer Jordan Peele, has come up with a very slick, macabre and sophisticated reboot for the Candyman myth, a satirical critique of racism in the era of Black Lives Matter. As with Bernard Rose's 1992 film, the setting is the Cabrini Green housing projects in Chicago. In Clive Barker's original story, The Forbidden, it was an estate in Liverpool, where a terrifying demon called the Candyman will appear if you say his name five times in the mirror. Candyman is a supernatural roar of rage against racism, a voodoo of social justice, and also a symptom of inequality and bad housing. This Candyman emerges symbolically from a broken interior wall in the projects. The scene is now modern-day Chicago, where a fashionable young artist, Anthony McCoy, played by Yahya abdul Mateen II, lives in a glitzy new apartment built on the torn-down Cabrini Green site with his partner Brianna, played by Tayona Harris, who is a gallerist and art dealer. He hears about the Candyman myth and finds in it an electrifying inspiration for a new show, the centrepiece of which is a painting behind a mirror, before which visitors are invited to say a Candyman five times. And when sneery white critics show up, they have the life expectancy of red-shirted crew members aboard the USS Enterprise. There's also some smart commentary on the nature of art, of Candyman as the artistic expression of the collective unconscious, and the nature of gentrification itself and the part played by artists' colonies in creating value in low-rent districts, which will soon be exploited by property developers. Candyman is a tasty confectionery of satire and scorn. The next film is fascinatingly tricky to pigeonhole. It could be a ghost story or a fever dream of neoliberalist capitalism's troubled birth in the 1980s. It could be Jude Law's best performance since the talented Mr. Ripley. It's The Nest. Things are dried up here for me. Oh, ho, 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 ho! Oh, yeah! There's an opportunity. Where? London. This would be our fourth move in 10 Turn years. Backwards. But money's fine, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is a fresh start. How about this? You shouldn't be working for someone else. Be your own boss. Build your own place. <laughs> own your own horses. Something doesn't feel right. It's not your job to worry. You leave that to your husband. Sean Durkin, who a decade ago gave us the disturbing Manson-esque cult drama Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene, directs. The setting is the mid-80s and Jude Law plays Rory, a fast-talking British bond trader who's made a fortune in Manhattan. He's married to an American woman called Alison, played by Carrie Coon, who is a horse trainer. And they have two kids, one of which is Alison's from a previous relationship. One day, Rory high-handedly announces to Alison that they are moving away from their happy, prosperous home in New York State because he has been offered a job in the city of London and he wants to return to his old manor in triumph. And their problems begin when he rents a huge old Jacobean mansion in Surrey for them to live in, once used as a base by Led Zeppelin, apparently, while they were getting their heads together for a spell in the country. But weird, creepy things are happening in this house, which might be haunted. And Alison has disturbing evidence that Rory can't pay the bills. Is he? Is their whole married life together a ghostly mirage? 
in many ways, The Nest is one of the most disturbing films I've seen this year. Disturbing because its eerie, uncanny happenings are, of course, metaphorical in one sense, but in some ways also not metaphorical. They're just happening. There's a real shiver of fear. My final film this week is the excellent Suad from Egyptian director Aitan Amin. Basant Ahmed plays Suad, a bright 19-year-old student in a small Egyptian town who is always burnishing her image on social media. She is using her smartphone and digital technology generally to create and modify her identity, her own sense of self. To her family, she is a good Muslim, but she is secretly conducting a tempestuous relationship online with a guy called Ahmed in far off Alexandria, a man whom she has never met face to face and who is much older than her with a life of his own of which Suad has no conception. The other person in this triptych is Suad's gentle, caring sister Rabab, whose own destiny is to intertwine with Suad's and Ahmed's. It's an intriguing film about addiction to social media and how social media addicts, like drug addicts, can get psychologically way out of their depth. Nowadays, everyone, celebrities and non-celebrities alike, talks about mental health, and this film, with its subtle build-up to a tragedy, shows how social media can be the number one enemy of mental health. But it never hectors or preaches, and the performances are great. Once again, it's time for me to say farewell and also to abandon what little self-respect I might have accrued and say to you, if you've enjoyed this vlog, and for heaven's sake, who wouldn't, then please buy my book, The Films That Made Me, an edited selection of my essays and reviews for The Guardian. Please also give this vlog a share and a like online and also subscribe and leave a comment to say that you've subscribed. See you next week.